Okay, welcome back to the second half of the event today. A quick note to those of you who are new to the BFI. We've got a program notes at the back, so if you want to find out more about the film, grab some notes on your way out. That's something um, we do with all the screenings here. Um, just to quickly introduce, uh, or just before I introduce our panel, uh, we have some of the cast here. So we have, oh, first of all, some apologies. Uh, Rudolf Walker was unable to make it today because he's working Rudolph on a big Walker, celebration of oh. East End, so many decades of East Enders. So yeah, he wasn't able to attend. Um, Chucky Venn, I think, is shooting casualty um, oh. in Cardiff, so he's not with us. Um, we do have in the audience Hannah E. Spellstead, who may well, play the role of the judge in the okay. film. But she wants to stay in the audience, um, but just to acknowledge her here today. Any other parts? Uh, oh, my. Okay, so um, okay, yeah. I'm one of the cast. Uh, one of the cast. Uh, uh, back with us. <laughs> we have <laughs> Nadia Denton, who is, uh, she's written this fantastic study of the Nigerian film industry. We're struggling to, to catch up with um, the remarkable, prolific output of Nigerian cinema. Nadia's created this book really combines uh, critical insight um, and insider industry information about how it works and how it's changing very, very fast. So we've got a couple of copies in the, the shop. Um, if you're interested in this area, do I recommend going and, and grab a copy. Um, and then finally, we have back uh, Dr. Amabini, who spoke this morning about the historical period uh, and can respond to your questions. Michael Morave, who's one of the cast, I'm sure you recognize, starting with you, your response to today's screening and the experience of I've seen the film here at the Thank you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Maybe I'll just pass to my director. I'll let him take the first step. Michael Morabe played Oba Vurabe. I've been accused separately. All of the places that are shown, that we are supposed to costume him the way he moved in the film so that people can easily recognize him. So I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, Mike Omoegbe of Bahavurame in the Vision 1897. <laughs> and uh, it's also very important to know that um, deliberately we chose not to use any known face for the role. So it's very exciting for me to tell you that this is Mike Omoegbe's first film ever in his life. <laughs> and uh, also very interesting is that uh, we took him from the pupit. He's a pastor. <laughs> so uh, convincing him to come play a fetish king. Uh, as against his faith as a man of God <laughs> was another issue. But I'm sure that uh, he's enjoying it now. Uh, <laughs> he's traveling everywhere. And uh, when they see him in Benin, if we're, we're, we're somewhere else now, somebody saw him. Ah, oh, that was a good reference. <laughs> so he gets that quite a lot. Um, I'm very fulfilled that. This number of people actually came to see this work in London. That is the most exciting point for me. And looking at the audience, that uh, people from all walks of life uh, are here. Um, I don't want to judge, but I hope you enjoy our modest, unapologetic presentation of this work from our perspective. Uh, let me give kudos to the doctor that did uh, uh, the paper presentation. 
when he, she was talking, I thought like that. She wasn't our consultant. <laughs> because uh, she actually captured um, the story. Maybe from our point of view too, the way we wanted to present it. And the writer did uh, the palace and several historians that we spoke to. Uh, there have been literature books, uh, trials of, uh, of our foreign men, written by Professor Ahmed Yelman, commissioned by the federal government to celebrate uh, 100 years of the invasion. Uh, the most popular being Ovora Menor Baisi by the late uh, Professor Olarotimi. But deliberately, I didn't want to work with, uh, adapt any of these works. Uh, uh, maybe because Professor Olarotimi was a Yoruba man. Uh, Ame Yerima is from a but from Aoji speaking part of uh, Benin. But it was the first time that a Benin man uh, was actually telling this story and the first time we were putting it in motion picture. Uh, I'll stop here. I hope you enjoyed the work. Uh, I was surprised. I told him, I said, ah, nobody's moving. Uh, as a filmmaker, that's the way you judge your film. The one you are sitting behind, the one who see people that want to storm out, like in Washington, uh, when the heads were rolling, some white folks couldn't stand it. They ran, <laughs> they ran out of the hall. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm quite impressed that uh, everybody stayed out uh, there. I'm sure they enjoyed it. They enjoyed it. Uh, let me also give kudos to Safa, the organizer of Safa, uh, for the support that he has given. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nadia, just um, to pick up with you and, and, and a response to a film that's really part of a new wave of uh, international films, films that will be of interest right across the world. Um, well, certainly for me, I think what was quite striking, having seen some of your earlier work, is um, the amount of time that you obviously took to craft the work that you did with your cast and crew to try and get some of the performances. Um, I think that really shone through compared to, as you referred to earlier, the sort of core Nollywood. Um, and I think definitely there was a sense that you were thinking about this international audience, people from different walks of life, as you said, who would be <coughs> watching this work. Um, and obviously trying to get this historical message a bit further than it would if you perhaps kept it in a contained style just for a local audience. Um. Um. I must confess that this is my first Nollywood film that I viewed from beginning to end. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is an honest confession. My mother is um, an avid fan of Nollywood films. And this is the first one I, I've seen and I commend it highly. I saw it, I was able to get a, a preview from David, so I actually saw it on Thursday at home. And I was very much struck and I liked the, the, the position that I come from, that the past is not dead, that history lives in the present. And I think that was conveyed in terms of the first segment of the film, in terms of um, Charles Venn, um, who plays the man who steals the, or, or reclaims rather, reappropriates the, the Bainey, elements of the Bainey bronzes from the British Museum, and then it goes back into history, then it comes back into the past. And that very much fits into my kind of um, philosophical approach about history. That history is connected to the past, the present, and the future. And our future challenge is, as I said in my, my talk, in terms of an issue of restitution and reparations, um, those material artifacts that belong to African people. And other peoples as well, let's not forget that the Elgin marbles as well are currently in Russia, are being displayed um, by the, the British um, Museum. So there's also an issue of reparations or restitutions for, for other peoples as well. But that was the first thing that I liked about the film in terms of intertwining the past and the present and the future. Um, the second thing that I really liked about the film was um, a very strong African agency. African resistance, and it showed that Africans, though we were outmaneuvered by the superior military technology of Europeans, um, we were by no means passive bystanders, and we tried within our means, our machetes and our bows and arrows, um, to give a good fight. Um, 
or to use Bernie Grant's word, you know, to give them a good licking. Um, so <laughs> that very strongly came across um, in the film. And lastly as well, um, I thought there was a very good um, depiction of the, the extent to which the Edo people, the Bini people are steeped in their historical, traditional, cultural customs and traditions and spirituality that came across very strongly, um, whether you um, agree or disagree. Um, the ogre there, who I'm learning as a pastor, I'm sure he may not be sympathetic genuinely to some of those kind of spiritual traditions, but that came across very strongly in terms of the culture, traditions, and the fact that the Bini people felt that their, their customs and traditions had been violated by the Europeans, apart from the fact that the invasion was about um, the Europeans seeking to exploit and um, um, gain access to the rich resources of, um, of Benin. So from a historian's perspective, those things were very strongly conveyed um, um, in the film, and therefore I commend you. Okay, just before we hand over to you, and as ever, please, we have to roaming mics. So what we'll do is we'll take, and, and if the more you can limit it to a question as opposed to a, um, a <coughs> response to the film, the more questions we can take. But just to kick it off, Lancelot, the, the, the location of the British Museum was, was very important. So you, it looks as though you've had the British Museum's partnership from the start, um, which is highly appropriate to the subject of the film. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. It's filmed there. You've, you've gone back, you've shown the film at the British Museum. Has that begun some serious debate about, uh, as Anna puts it, uh, reparations and restitution? Yeah, yeah. Coincidentally, uh, June, June 22nd, um, one of the British spies that uh, led the invasion, the great grand son, Mark Walker returned voluntarily <coughs> uh, two of the artifacts that was in his family possession. <laughs> and uh, four of us spoke at the palace of the Oba Benin. It was a huge ceremony to receive this Artworks, um, and I said whether it was just mere coincidence or by spirituality, we have uh, played our role, our part in history, where our agitation. Uh, they didn't say they read about the film, but when we were filming in London, that we first got the call that some man wants to return. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> the one that were with him. So that was a pointer to the fact that we're, we're in the right direction. But for me, I made this film primarily for economic reasons. I'm not very bothered about the artwork, artwork being returned. But I'm strongly advocating for the finances that this museum probably had accrued over the years from this box. So in turn, I, I ran into an artifact in Boston, in antiquity shop, and I saw one from Benin. The asking price was $54,000. I said, my God. That, I took my mind back to the street, because the street is still there. A good street where they make all of this stuff. If a house there or a family now goes to sell one artifact for $54,000, I wonder the kind of life they'll be living from their craft. So, from the work, I am saying the British took the art, but they couldn't take the craft. The craft is still with the people. But unfortunately, the irresponsibility of the African government, particularly 
the government of Nigeria and Edo State, they have not been able because all they struggle about is the oil that they can get quick returns. So I was using this movie to prick the conscience of the government. But there are several other areas that our people can earn foreign exchange. And so importantly is art. But unfortunately, I still have not gotten endorsement for this film from the state government, where I come from, where Igbo Street is uh, located. Uh, not the federal government, who just celebrated 100 years of another jamboree of Nigeria, because if Benin didn't fall in 1897, probably there wouldn't have been a Nigeria today. And the historian alluded to that fact. It was after the fall of Benin, because before the fall of Benin, Lagos had fallen, uh, 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 Jaja of Opobo had fallen, uh, Nene of, uh, of, Nana of Chekini had fallen. All of these West African um, 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 uh, uh, kingdoms had fallen. The only kingdom that was still standing, contrary to the views of the British, as presented by the Portuguese, that the Benin was very organized. That is why you saw the king. The British were coming. There is a minister in charge of defense. Make sure the territorial integrity of the place is protected. You make sure that what so there was a government in place. So again, you would have, if I proceed that, probably if this guy didn't come, we would have been more developed than we are today. Thank you. Okay, we have two mics, um, so please wait for a mic. And wait, if you're towards the back, you'll have to wave frantically so we can see you. Okay, we have um, someone here. Yeah, yes, that it's Elizabeth Waifu. Thank you very much. So, I mean, it was an excellent um, performance and a great portrayal of the history of Benin. And the film evokes a lot of very strong emotions sense of injustice and powerlessness and I just wondered whether the program and this time as when you have do you bear in mind that this is going to evoke really strong emotions amongst the new people and those who perhaps are sympathizers and some young people who are not were not born and maybe were not really aware of the artifacts and may not really be caught in the um, in, in the web of return of the artifacts. Is, do you have a message? Is there a positive message going forward to people who are watching this? Do you have a, a message that empowers others in watching this movie to go away, feel strong, and perhaps deal with issues that they may face in the future? Thank you, thank you. Again, I refer to our historian who described the beliefs the strength, the resilience of a people. Unfortunately, if you do not know where you're coming from, it's going to be very difficult to determine where you're going to. For every Benin person, African, well, the first place shown was the African Film Festival in Canada. And the reactions we, get, we got was first from the Caribbeans. Uh, that I came with some of the artifacts the passion it evoked, people wanted to touch. They want to take photographs with the, with the artifact. To them, some that were just collectors, the film has opened their eyes to look beyond that artifact as just a decorative piece. The film succeeded in doing that. For Africans, um, I wasn't preaching hate. Somebody had posited a question while we see that. Why did you give the guy uh, a white <laughs> girlfriend? <laughs> For me, I wanted the world to know that I was not preaching hate. That's why, that is why I gave him a white girlfriend. And if you see the way she dressed, there was a marriage cultural marriage, which is another thing that the film is putting forward. But the issue of injustice, the issue of injustice,
the way most of the time some, some British guys were killed in Benin and a superpower came to punish the people that killed the people. Nobody had talked about the energy that was put into preventing this guy to respect the sanctity of a people. That was why we are located at. Don't come. We have a sacred festival that is going on that forbids the over to receive visitors. Meanwhile, we saw when the king first received them. And it was also very clear that 400 years before now, the Beninese have been doing business with the white men. So they were not just coming for the first time. So they were more at peace with the Portuguese, the Dutch, the French guys who come to do business with them and they go back. There was this mutual respect. And the Obafarame wanted to follow that trend of mutual respect. So finding back your strength, knowing where you're from, and the energy that sustains your generation or your lineage is very important. And that is what every other African that has seen this film has come up to say. to say to substantiate his point but and also an answer to your question in regards to um, evoking of strong emotions um, but also I would hope that the film would inspire a younger generation to take up the issue of restitution restitution being the fact that um, stolen artifacts um, the engagement in this grand theft bazaar that the Europeans engaged in when they conquered Africa partitioned Africa that that struggle has yet to be waged. Um, and as Lancelot has said, we do have incompetent governments and democratic governments who have priorities other than the interests of their people. They pressure these people from them, and those governments need to change. And it's for young people to be mobilized to take up the fight and struggle in Edo State, also at the level of the African Union, Africans in the diaspora. The issue of restitutions is not going away because it hasn't gone away for the Greeks who are still seeking for the restitution of the Parthenon marbles, otherwise known as the Elgin marbles, to be returned to, to Greece. So that is an issue that has a relevance for today, and young people can channel their energies into the issue of restitution, the return of stolen artifacts to African owners. <laughs> Thank you. Can we just uh, very quickly, Harris? Thank you. Yeah, if you just just show some respect, gentlemen here with question. Yeah, uh, compared to American movies that I come out, I'm very impressed by your film. Not just because, you know, like it was made by ordinary people, but it showed a humanity that you never get to see in movies about black people, especially by the so-called uh, American black movie makers who t t make stereotypes and archetypes, which I don't want to spend my money on, but I was glad it was a... Uh, there was also frustration. When I go to a bookshop about popular history about Africa, I never knew all this. This is the best film I've seen because I know the, about the humanity and I know individuals. Who are these people? I don't know anything about Benin. But that comes to a question. When I go to Falls or any other bookshop and I look in a bookshop about popular history on Africa and uh, African countries, why don't I ever see your books there, Benin? Any popular history. I always see European historians about Africans, but I don't see black historians writing about popular history about Africa. Why is that? And it frustrates me. Okay, it's irritating. Uh, okay. I, Anna, would you like to respond? Books about Africa. There, there are. You have to seek them out. I mean, uh, <laughs> I have to seek them out. I want to see you writing about them. <laughs> <laughs> we are there. You need to seek For those of you. Okay. Okay, those of you who are, um, I, I knew Dr. Abbabidi was the former editor, I think, of Panzuka, which is a, a website about Afri current affairs in Africa and African history. Okay, you've made your point, sir. Thank you. Okay, we have a person up here. Yes. In watching that movie, it just reminded me 
of what Marcus Garvey said in his book, The Philosophy and Opinions of Marcus Garvey, that only we as Africans can tell our story. Because we live it. No one else can tell our story except us as Africans. The next thing is that I disagree with you and I would like your response on this strongly when you said that the British were different in terms of the trading as compared to the Portuguese, the French and others because all of them came to Africa as vultures, imperialists, robbing, raping and murdering our people. They are no different, they are all the same. They came to Africa and they are still there in Africa doing the same thing to our people. And I am not pulling any punches. And the final thing is that is precisely one of the problems. That shouldn't have to be because we don't have to prove anything about us being racist. We are not racist. We are victims of racism. So that was not necessary. And I found that offensive. <laughs> It's important, it's important I say this. Can you wait till the speak, please? Thank you, thank you very thank much. You. It's important I say this. Before the British Museum allowed this thing to scream, they were scared that the thing was going to invoke protest. <laughs> <laughs> there, there was security said uh, all the interviews I granted were all sit out. It was they were going to call it up. I that, think, I think will you wait? I re I, I, I respect <laughs> I respect the way you feel it should have been made. It was not an apologist uh, thinking. It was deliberate that the girl, I am preaching love for one another. That is the kind of word I am advocating. But the issue of injustice should be taken more seriously. In looking for books and films about Africa by Africans, most of film funding in Africa by the Francophone countries are always funded by the French government. And as a result, nobody would have been able to make this kind of a film, if it is funded by Europeans. Maybe the script will be screened and all of that, but this was entirely 100% our funds, so we are bold enough to tell this story. I'm sure it's going to motivate quite a lot of others to tell more stories like this, write more books like this, and give us a place in history. That, 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 that's my Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you. And the first thing that you said was you wanted the history of Africans to be told from the African perspective. I am from Kenya, and my mother was in the concentration camps in Kenya from the age of eight, and she was there for eight years. Uh, when Gordon Brown went to Kenya, he said he's fed up of apologizing. What you want uh, us to do is to be heard. We don't want uh, sympathy, we just want to be heard because this year, or this week we have been celebrating the Holocaust. But my tribe were massacred in concentration camps. No mention, no celebration. We just want our history to be told. You said you want to hear history about Africa. I am currently writing a book about my mother's experience in a concentration camp. My father was orphaned 
and condemned to a life in the streets of Nairobi. But I am here today, and I thank you very much for this film. Someone at the back here who's been waiting a while. It's me, David. Yeah, it's me. Okay, Charlie. I can't say. Okay, Charlie. Yes, yeah. Um, I want to congratulate the director because being a supporter of Africa Odyssey, it's the first time I've ever seen a director who's had the courage to show a film that says without any apology, without any apology. I congratulate you. Thanks for bringing the missing. Thanks for bringing the missing link regarding our history. But one of the things I want to know as a, as a director, will you actually challenge some of the government from the African continent why they're still suppressing our history? You have a young generation now who has a burning desire to find that missing link with our history. And it's about time we have to start to tell our story from other point of view. But first, you have to challenge the, the diaspora or the cultural diaspora who is in charge of the African continent because as you said you're just thinking about oil and diamond, oil and diamond and there's much more. What about the gold and any other things? Will you be making a film that challenge the whole African continent um, how they've suppressed a lot of um, our history? Thank you. Okay, just to um, just to pick up quickly with uh, Charlie Phillips' comments, and also some of the last comment about funding and francophone funding. I think, and, and I think Nadia, you'll probably be able to fill us in here. Unlike, say, the UK, where there is some support and funding for productions, I understand in Nigeria there is no government funding for films. So no, to, to make. Okay, perhaps yeah. you could tell us a bit about that. Um, so, I mean, in recent years, the government have instituted a loan um, for the Greater Centre, um, yeah, and there's also a, a grant, uh, which is through Project Act in Hollywood. Uh, I'm not sure yet how many grants have been distributed, but there are initiatives now to encourage the film industry. Yeah. Um, thanks to the present government of uh, President Bula Jonathan has shown courageously, so much support for the industry. Imagine what is happening here tonight. Uh, the passion, the involvement. I think this is a message, a challenge for all. It's not about I've contributed man. All of the interviews I've granted, I said, are you going to make this kind of a film again? What's your next project? I said, still invasion. <laughs> I said, I want to give five years to sell this film. Whatever it is that you can do, because we still have limitations. Thanks so much to you, BFI, um, J2 Consult, and Zafo. This has been the most unimaginable night ever. Who do just like in Benin? I'm hoping that people will take this up and say, okay, I want to show this in this school. I want to show this here, because it's beyond talking. You want to go to the internet, you want to write about your experience tonight? That is going to go a long way to help this project. We want more people to see this piece. There is so little that we can do on our own. So it needs some kind of collective uh, uh, synergy for us to be able to advance this to another level. That is my take. I think we've got a question back here, then we'll come to the front. Go <laughs> uh, ahead. I thank you for, for contributing to this big project. Put the mic on there. Put the mic on there. Okay, can you hear me? Sorry. Oops. We need the other mic, I think. Okay. All right, we'll come back to you in a second. We'll just take this question. I've got a very loud voice. All right. <laughs> okay, go, go ahead, sir. To start with, I want to thank you all for contributing a lot to this big project, this mega project, telling the African story in the African way. It's a very wonderful 
perspective. I want to thank the director for okay, bringing the mic. Yeah, and if he's not yet. I want to thank the, the director for bringing this story to light. He has done a very wonderful thing, and he won't realize it. But there's one thing I want to tell we, the Africans. You know, it's not about what, what, the, what, the, what the, the people that got power have stolen from us this time around. It's about kind of creating a platform for, <laughs> for forgiveness and also kind of giving thanks to the opportunity that you have gotten to realize your position and also create a, a platform for, for unity and peaceful coexistence. In the sense that it's not about, it's about unity, it's about peace and also moving forward. And you cannot go back to what has happened. It's always the story of the victorious. It's not the story of the loser. Thank you very much. Let me just take this gentleman here, Sam. This is Sam and Wuzio from the Zafa Festival. Uh, before I say anything, I would like to say a very big thank you to David. Uh, this evening wouldn't have been possible without David's support. There is one thing about us making movies, condemning movies, and applauding movies. The bringing Invasion 1897 to, to this level is because BFI believe in what they see. I want to say to um, Lancelot, I've had series of condemnations about invasion from people who have not seen it. But I say to them, there's only one way to look at a movie. It's from historic background. A lot of us Africans who are sitting here believe in Hollywood movies. We never believe in things coming out from African stores. But people like Lancelot has constantly brought out historic movies. Movies that shows that Africans have place elsewhere. Today, I'm asking you all sitting here, if Africans, Nigerians, we are not allowing the British to come into Africa, there was no visa then, isn't it? We don't have visa to come here and claim our freedom here. You go to Africa wherever you want. Will it be possible? So. Uh, there are a lot of other films coming from the historical background, but one thing is for you, the, uh, the audience, to please support, support our African struggle, whether it is historic, it is loving, it is any other thing support the African film. I'm so proud of today okay, that Sam. BFI is worth it. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name is Esosa Ahi, uh, Nigeria Magazine. I will say kudos to you, um, Lancelot, for what you've done. This is very good. We know books, pictures, tell a very good story. And to be telling it in your own words is a big deal. And to see a lot of people come here is equally very big. I'm, I'm very proud that we have a panel of different people with different perspectives. Art and culture is a big deal. Art and culture is financially a viable, freedom and liberating thing that we liberate a lot of Africans, we liberate a lot of black people. What is asking is, we shouldn't be looking at things emotionally. We should present things the way it is. The, the film that we watched today has been depicting Africans as savages. We have art, we have culture, and that is what should be coming out, especially with the younger generation. They Quest need question. to know, they need to know. So the question I'm, say, I'm, I'm asking is that a lot has gone into this film. We know a lot of funding has gone into this. It's accessing the funding. There are a lot of uh, people who are very okay. talented. So Lancelot, yeah, crowdfunding and things like that. So what I'm saying is, 
Lancelot, how did you achieve this? So that others who are actually aspiring <laughs> to do this, whether as a, a book writers or filmmakers or anything, they can also do it. But congratulations. Okay, thank you, thank you. What we'll do is we'll go back on this side to lady with her hand up in the middle, and then we'll take those two questions. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I just wanted to ask you, have you shown this film in Benin or anywhere in Africa? And what was the result, the response? Okay, th thanks for having So we've got two questions here. One was how you source the money for the film, and the second is screenings in Benin. In terms of funding, I uh, just were say ambition. I was just ambitious. I'm very, 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 very determined that I will not die if I do not tell the story. <laughs> I used to say this. People thought I was joking. Because, of course, the highest uh, amount of money I put in the film before this, probably $50,000 or so. Yeah, I needed about a million dollars to make this. And Whenever anybody hears that in Nigeria, I say, are you, are, you, are you crazy? We have just 21 functioning cinemas in the whole of Nigeria, servicing 160 or 70 million people. So making back the money, it's not, it's not, it's not even considered that if you want to tell a story like this. But some individual who just caught the ball, I made a film titled Adesua, and that was quite popular. It was historical, set in 1752 AD, and uh, a lot of people liked it. That was how the funding for this, a particular individual, funded it before every other person started getting interested. So three of us putting money here, uh, Senator Desi Danjuma, Captain Osa Kumbo, and Lancelot Imaswan. And at that time, I borrowed from him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, uh, well, the, the, the other question was about screenings in... The yes, film. it was... Um, we had premieres uh, in Benin, Lagos, and Abuja, and uh, it was released in Kalabatu, and it was officially released 5th of December in Nigeria. It's still running. It's still running in Benin. The reviews have been quite wonderful, and uh, but the money hasn't come, though. <laughs> 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 okay, we have a question here the, uh, in the middle. Yeah, we'll so just want to hand it up, and then we'll come to this gentleman in the front. I just wanted to know why did you use um, English as a uh, language of the film? Well. Why did you? Would it have been more authentic to use uh, the Benin language? <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the question keeps uh, propping up. Um, it was because of rich. It was because of rich. When we speak English in our films, several international film festivals we go to, some of our white folks will tell us they don't even understand the English we are speaking. I'm not sure whether they are getting it now. So I ask myself, if I want this film to reach where I want it to reach, I should look for a language that uh, well, the brother I uh, reach. So I chose English. Outside of the English, I see subtitled it. So that if they say, I'm, I didn't hear what those black guys were saying, you can read what they were saying. Uh, <laughs> so it was because of rich, that was why. But if you, if you carefully watched, you discover that the language of the king and his people were a little elevated, was poetic. So it was assumed that they were speaking their own language. And we didn't just like to pick some day-to-day -day language on the street. So it was elevated uh, a great deal. Yeah. Of course, I must begin by adding my thanks and praise. It's a very significant film, and it's a film that is added to a long line of other African and African diaspora films that speak truth to power without apology. It's not the first film like this. But it's a very significant film, and it's a very good film, and it allows us to engage in a pan-African dialogue. The first, in terms of that dialogue, my brother, the first thing I just want to say is that it's wonderful that the BFI have opened their doors. But we must understand that we are here like this because of struggles that have gone on, just like the struggle that you had there. People didn't just 
from the kindness of their heart one day let us in. We have been engaged in this country in terms of struggles for access and inclusion for many years. So African people have gone before you to knock down these doors that got you here. That's the first thing I wanted to say. The second thing I wanted to say was I wanted to go back to that point that you made in terms of the fact that you're not interested in the, art, the artifacts themselves, you're interested in the money that could be accrued from them. If we are not interested, if you are not interested, Brother Benin, in the artifacts, what, who's going to be interested? If we cannot value our artifacts above and beyond their monetary value, this death did not happen. They weren't interested necessarily in the monetary value when they took the artifacts. They were interested in what can be gained from the war on our culture. What can be gained by debasing us? What can be gained by saying that what we have is not of value? So we have to think again. We, if we, what we, what we think about our gods is not important to us, then who will it be important to you? I must congratulate you, my brother, pastor, minister, for taking this role because I know that was not easy in Nigeria. I know that was not easy. And the ancestors and the gods of Africa spoke to you, I'm sure. Jesus could have been by the side. I'm sure they spoke to you. So, but, so I think that's also, and our sister Emma, our brilliant sister said that, we need to underscore that. You were very brave to do that. And I would hope that you continue, um, our, our director, brother, you continue because it is an atrocity that there is a tradition of saying that our, in Nollywood films, that our traditions are totally meaningless, are works of the devil. Our sister Amma didn't have time to talk about the fact that the British said, we have to let in the missionaries, right? And I will tell you, I'm not speaking, I can honor all spirituality, but if we can't honor our own, what are we saying? I just wanted to get your response, and thank you so much. Good, af good afternoon, brother. My, my name is Roger. Um, I'm not going to speak uh, dishonestly to you. There's a lot about your film that I didn't like. However, I'm not going to voice that publicly, but I will, I will say that I enjoyed the opening flourish and the argument and the way how that was presented, bringing it into the present. My question for you is this, though. The king was a very, as, as I received him, was a very unsympathetic character. It's a, it's a character that you would, I, I certainly had no sympathy for. Also, um, joining on to a, a, another question that was asked a while ago about the, the language usage, why, why did you, I mean, was it deliberate to have the English, the white people in the, in the film, speaking very unnaturally, the, the, the unnatural English that they spoke? I, I mean, the, the, was it deliberate that the, the black characters spoke English, but spoke it a bit more fluently, than the way that the white people spoke it. Was that deliberate? And was the, the humor in the film, was that also, being a, a, a serious subject, was the humor deliberate? And, and what was the purpose of bringing it into the film, which was supposed to be a serious film? Sit up again, please. Your last, your last one. I was saying, about the humor that was in the film, the, were those humorous parts in the film or, or the bits which, which I found for humorous, and I think other people did, were they deliberate, were they intentionally humorous, and why have them in a film that was really supposed to be about a very serious subject? Well, uh, my response to the first lady that spoke, thank you so much. Um, when I say I am not interested let me claim this way. There is a whole lot of poverty back home. And people has strength that can generate great living for themselves. How do we as Africans, how do we even first value this 
artworks, first and foremost. A discourse has been generated. Some will say restitution, reparation. That argument has been on. Mine would also introduce something new to it that there has been a whole lot of economic benefit <coughs> to the people that have had these things. Probably, you don't just walk into the British Museum like that. Maybe you have to pay something, or I don't know why what. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. So I'm saying there is so much money that this guy, these guys have made. If some of those money are repatriated, they are one step at a time. Because the last argument when Prince Edward Kenswa, when they brought this up, the question was uh, where are they going to where are we going to even keep them? We as Africans, do we place as much premium on this stuff? So this was what I'm not completely saying no. Everywhere the film has shown, has shown, whenever it gets to the scene where you see the artwork being lifted, there's always this reaction from the audience. Because deliberately, I carried people to the point. The emphasis is actually about those artifacts that were taken. That was what we introduced from the beginning, why I linked it with today. So, uh, permit my use of language. Entirely, I placed a uh, premium on this work. The ones made in the past and the ones of today, because I had an exhibition of a young boy today who is making a living from this work. That people are buying, when we show the film, he has a bit some of this work and people are buying. And that is giving him, uh, it was the film that actually took him out of the country for the first time to have his work exhibited. So I'm actually bringing global attention to the artworks uh, on, uh, on, on his own. I hope that uh, settles that. And uh, my brother, they, sometimes I get very nervous that people get too sad watching the film. So there are some characters we try to play up a little, like uh, a Yebo here. He didn't see anything funny, but whenever, everywhere, the film has shown, and he said, the meaning of the name is that the man who lives the white man, a Yebo here. That was the meaning of his name. And whenever he does, and we definitely will pick that character to let the season so that he doesn't, as you, you need to scale up. Yeah. You need to uh, 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 modulate. So that's why it was important we throw in some guy that will make people uh, 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 laugh a bit. He, he wouldn't have just run seriously. Then, if you say the king did come out uh, sympathetic, uh, the, the king? Uh, well, uh, uh, well it, it's, um, once an artwork goes out, it's perceived from by different people differently. I, I didn't quite see that as coming out weak, but in history, in history, in becoming a king, you choose the title you want to be called. It had two names, Obaseki and Ovoramen, no by sea. The meaning of Ovoramen that is globalized. And you will agree that true to prediction, the name he chose, if he chose Obaseki, he will live as long as he wants to live. But if he chooses Ovoramen, he is going to sh live a very short but eventful life. And that has come to pass. He is the most talked about king in the history of Benin till today. In Nigeria. That to date, we are gathered here now because of Oba, Oba. And again, in terms of literature, character flaws, you will allow that to play. He has his own, it was true. What you saw at the beginning, he was very mean. He was very aggressive. He got into the throne at 38. 38 and by 44 he was already dethroned 
And he achieved all of this until today. His name is everywhere. So he has his floor. He was too mean. The place the wife was trying to calm him down. Where he gave the daughter away to the king was all to pacify the people that he was too. Oh, this person comes and go and kill him. Which was what the British used against him that it was it was uh, it was a city of blood. The man was too blood tasting. But then there was an epidemic that killed people. And it was misinterpreted to me that he was the person that was using his people for which was the point she raised in her talk. That they were not trying to uh, love us more than ourselves, which is still what is happening today. And that is also deliberate about this work. Invasion, is this still going on? Oh, yes. Oh, are they loving us more than us? Oh, yes. Just recently, John Kerry made an overnight visit to Nigeria. And we are still asking, why this sudden love? Obama has never visited Nigeria since again. What is fishy? Uh, Boko Haram has been killing. Why this sudden love? The election is coming because they want their interests to be protected. So, these are some of the things that the film uh, throw. And the character, you must give him this like this. And he was warned. The daughter had a dream. The chief priest warned him that it was an impending danger. So he knew. And that was how I just felt I could play it. Yeah. Okay. We, we, we sort of came very close to the end. So what I'm going to do is quickly just picking up with Anna here. A I few words to, make, to wrap um, up. Yeah, for a few um, points in regards to your your perception of Oba and the film in terms of your indifference in him being perceived, you seen him as being weak. In the literature, he is portrayed, and even this is by Africans such as Toy and Falola, who I mentioned, as being a king, and all kings you know, have monopoly on rule, have total power, absolute power. And when he came into office, he did purge his kingdom of chiefs who he saw, perceived as undermining him, different factions. So he did have a reputation of being very, very dictatorial, being an absolutist, authoritarian figure. And that is um, portrayed in, in, in the film. Um, and I think as Africans, whether in the diaspora or on the, on, or on the continent, there is a tendency for us to romanticize and glorify in terms of looking back at um, our history and gloss over the fact that we had kingdoms that speak of exploitation, that speak of class differentiation, that speak of inequalities, that speak of, speak of gender differences. Um, I appreciate in, in a film you cannot <laughs> grapple with all of these complexities and issues and abstract intellectual issues. But to come back to the Oba the King, and all kings, whether King Henry VIII or seventh in this country, are monarchical, absolutist, tyrannical leaders. And um, you know, that, that raises issues of justice, social justice, economic justice um, in his kingdom as well. But I, from the historiography, he was certainly um, you know, a very strong, dynamic um, leader. And it is a question of perception. We all have different perceptions of, of him, <coughs> his rule, and how he comes across. I'll stop there. Thank you. Nick, <laughs> thank you, Dr. Alibi. Nadia Denton, who's a Nigerian filmmaker's guide to success. A quick response before we... Um, just very uh, briefly, I mean, I think the film has achieved what it set out, which is to get us all talking. I mean, I think yeah. regardless of the aesthetic and how we might feel about it, you know, um, in terms of the characterizations and so on, what it's fundamentally done, which I think is the importance of film, is to get us thinking about issues and topics that otherwise might not be considered. Um, and I think that um, a very important point was made at the beginning about what's going to happen with this film over the next few years. The whole idea of having it as a kind of campaign or discussion point where it can travel and where it can be shown in schools and um, where it can be shown you know, um, at other cultural events and so on is very important. So I would certainly urge you um, if you do have platforms or if you do have ways that you can help the film get out to wider audiences to let yourselves be known, um, and obviously we all should try and combine our efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, one of the film's supporters, as well as an actor, in, in one of the lead cast, or lead cast member. A quick response to the, the screening before we. Uh... I want to thank everyone for watching this movie. Um, um, I want to ask that you help us to talk about this movie wherever you go. We need to make money. <laughs> yeah, um, um, it's it was a wonderful experience acting this. Um, like he said, it was my first 
And uh, part of the reason I think I believe so much in it and wanted to act in it is perhaps coincidentally, when I did my first degree, I wrote my project work on Oforami, uh, Oforami, not Baisi, written by Olaro TV. Uh, I wasn't thinking of acting it then, I was just thinking of writing about the character. And so somewhere along the line, maybe it rubbed off, I don't know. Um, to answer a little bit to what he said, just to add to she, what she has already said, um, Uvarame rose to the throne having to fight battles. Uh, the people that he instructed or he killed or asked them to kill were people who actually wanted to stop him from becoming the other. Um, so if you see what looks rough about him and what looks a little bit, uh, it is because he had to handle an empire that uh, wasn't so friendly at the time he ascended the throne of his fathers. And that could affect characterization a little bit, you know, the reality is not deodorized. And um, <laughs> but what we're saying is, it is no excuse whatsoever for an external power to uh, take him out. <laughs> and that is the truth. I want to thank all of you for the kind words that you have expressed. And um, I think this brings me into acting. <laughs> okay, just once again, I want to thank very much uh, Zafa Film Awards, who've been promoting Nigerian cinema in the UK, who brought this film to our attention, and who are helping to spread the word. I want to thank Eric Eyre, who've enabled uh, Lancelot to be with us this afternoon. I just want to hand over to uh, uh, colleague here um, from J2 Consults who have been promoting the film just to say a few thanks to his partners or media partners because we make these events happen through the support of a wide network and uh, please go ahead. <laughs>